pleasure to introduce Michael Dick. He's a principal at the Osborne Group, and Michael will be talking about value. How much of it do you have uh, in your family business? So welcome, Michael. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of today's Family Exchange Symposium and on maintaining a strong foundation in your family business. It's also encouraging to see so many business owners here to participate in these learning sessions. I used to say in today's business you had to get better to stay even, but now I think you have to excel to stay in the game. I was recently listening to Thomas Friedman, a three-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, who now believes that for anyone to be successful in business or in any profession, they need to chart a course of lifelong learning given the information and technology age that we're in. So I applaud you in the audience for taking time out away from your business to learn from others and would encourage you to do so as often as possible. And I also encourage FEX to continue to make these types of learning events available. I believe that learning is one of the true motivators in life. I also believe that building a value, valuable business creates a strong foundation for generational success. In this 20-minute segment, I hope to provide you with new perspective on how you can add value to your business. In preparing for this presentation, I realized that I've worked for many family businesses throughout my career. One might question why Procter & Gamble is on this list, but I assure you that history shows that from its inception in 1837, when two brother-in-laws, one a candle maker, William Proctor, and a, the other a soap maker, James Gamble, combined their business at the suggestion of their father-in-law. A family enterprise was created. P&G, similar to uh, Mother Parker, got through four generations of family leaders in the business. And during that time, those first 90 years, established many of the company's values and ethics that exist and guide the company today. At Osborne, we help businesses through critical transitions. Some of our clients are shown on this slide. Um, FH Welding went from looking to, at closure to an employee buyout with the interim leadership of an Osborne principal after the untimely death of the owner. The wife, who had no interest in continuing to run the business, asked us to help her close down the business. We actually came in, saw some value-enhancing opportunities that could be leveraged, hired new leadership, and facilitated an employee buyout to maximize the return for the surviving family members. What I've seen in family enterprises, for the most part, are owners who understand the value of your employees. Paul talked about wanting to make sure his employees are looked after if anything should happen. And I think that's critical for most uh, family enterprises. They are also willing to engage those employees in running the various aspects of the enterprise, and in some cases they become part of the extended family. <clears throat> family businesses are also more respectful of their customers and value those close relationships with their clients, knowing that delivering excellence in product and service will generate referrals or repeat business and improve the cash flow. This next chart demonstrates how I see those key foundational elements interacting. Simplistically speaking, Employment engagement will drive better customer satisfaction and increased customer satisfaction will deliver more cash flow. I know that's a pretty simplistic look at business, but I think it's one that I've adopted over my career, uh, both at Osborne and with Procter & Gamble. Missing from many family businesses, though, is the rigor that larger entities use to bind the organization together. The right combination of values and the process rigor will provide a solid foundation to build upon as has been discussed by some of our previous speakers. It's never too early in my mind to, to start thinking about succession and thinking about getting the right people in the right spots and then, as Paul indicated, giving them a chance to succeed by mentoring them with the right people. With every business, though, there comes that day of reckoning, hopefully with plenty of planning and before one of the six Ds um, catches up with the owner. We all soon need to realize and face the facts that none of us are getting younger, and sooner or later we're going to have to transition ownership of our businesses. This will be a test of how good a foundation you've built. Does it generate the value that you believe is appropriate? 
How valuable is your business in the eyes of the potential suitors or strategic partners? After the purchase goes through, will you wonder, should I have held out for a higher offer? I hope now to offer you some insights into a value building process that will help answer some of those questions. In the, in the uh, presence of continual learning um, at the Osborne Group, we three years ago decided to expand our knowledge on what creates value in a business. And we joined the Value Builder system to take advantage of the research that John Warlow, author of Built to Sell and the Automatic Customer, has developed based on input from 30,000 companies worldwide who have gone through an ownership transition or have been courted by a potential acquirer. What I like about John's perspective is that it goes well beyond just looking at the business, business's financial and growth projections to determine value, and it looks at several other key drivers of value in the business, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But it also looks at value in a business from a purchaser's perspective, and sometimes that's quite different from the owner's opinion of value. Let's take a look at the details. This is a list of the key drivers of value. Um, financial performance is pretty uh, straightforward. It is about revenue and, and your margins and how much pre-tax earnings you make. But it's also about are your financial statements audited? Uh, do you have employment contracts for your employees? Do you have in, in contracts with your suppliers that are um, allowing for change, etc.? So those are certainly things that are looked at in terms of financial performance. Growth potential. It looks at both vertical, horizontal, and geographical growth. Is your product, is the product or service that you're providing capable of being sold to more customers? Do you have other products that you could sell to your existing customer base? And how easy is your uh, business to be duplicated in another geographical location? So those are all certain things that are looked at when you talk about the value driver of growth potential. The next one, Switzerland structure, is a funny name, but if you think about Switzerland and the fact that they've been neutral throughout their existence as a country, you want a business that's neutral. And by that I mean you want a business that has, is not dependent on one customer, not dependent on one employee, and not dependent upon one supplier. And that is going to be what a purchaser looks at in terms of the Switzerland structure. Teeter-totter uh, principle is about cash flow. Many of you know that cash flow in a business is up and down, is variable, and certainly it depends on when do you collect your money. Do you collect your money upon signing a contract? Do you collect your money over the term of the contract? Or do you collect your money when the contract is finished? And that's the value that is generated by cash flow. Recurring revenue talks about um, contracted work. How much of the work that you have signed is under contract and, and will be under contract for the years to come? It also talks about recurring revenue from subscription processes um, and membership. Certainly Amazon Prime, Harley-Davidson, is getting a lot more money generated because people are willing to be members and pay an annual fee uh, for that membership and, and the perks that go along with it. Monopoly control talks about how, different, how you differentiate your product from um, your competition and what value do you add and, and how can you uh, ex extend that differentiation. Customer service talks about net promoter score and that really talks about how many um, of your customers would promote your business rather than just be neutral or talk negatively about your business. And then finally, the last value driver is hub and spoke and that talks to the level of involvement that the owner has in the business. Um, because there, and we'll talk about two of these in, in more detail. There are all important facts that purchasers look at when they are doing their due diligence, and so it's incumbent on anyone who's thinking about transition to know how they measure up on those eight value drivers. Let's talk a little bit about the um, virtuous uh, cycle of differentiation, monopoly control. As a business owner, your goal should be to find an attribute or benefit that your product makes in a unique market which will give them more control over product pricing, which in turn gives you higher margin, which gives you more money to market, allowing you to further differentiate your offering and starting this virtuous cycle, which we'd all like to be in with our products or our services. As an example, let's think about Panasonic. Um, 
A few years ago, Panasonic decided that they were going to enter into the crowded laptop market. When they entered, established brands already owned the attributes customers cared about. Apple was seen as the sexy one with a different operating system. Dell owned the benefits of direct uh, purchase from the manufacturer. And HP was viewed as the technical innovator. So where was Panasonic going to play in this environment? So if you're Panasonic, all of the obvious market positions are already taken. If you had tried to compete directly with any of the incumbents, your only weapon would have been a lower price, which they would have led to lower margins. They, had, they may have picked up some price sensitive customers, but as soon as one of the big incumbents matched their price, Panasonic would have been nudged out of the marketplace. It's important to understand and ask yourself two questions in order to develop a differentiating strategy. What do your customers care about most and how differentiating would that, be, would that benefit be if we offered it? Most laptop buyers cared about the things that Apple, Dell, and HP were offering, but there was a segment out there of the market that cared about something different. Police forces and military customers cared about how tough their laptop was. They wanted something that could stand up to the rigors of inside a squad car or in a forward operating military theater. Panic, Panasonic therefore launched the Toughbook brand. They made the toughest laptop on the market, which gave them a unique position in the marketplace and therefore they didn't have to compete on price and in fact they were charging seven or eight thousand dollars for these laptops. And then that allowed them to start the virtuous cycle, which gave them higher margins leading to more money for marketing their unique benefits, which led them to further cementing the Tough Book brand as a choice for people who operate in a rough and tumble environment. Pause for a minute and let you think about your products and service on the following continuum. Which of the following best describes the exclusivity of your business to your customers? And the continuum is laid out this way to show that as you move up the continuum, you're, you're actually enhancing the value of your business. One of our clients went directly to their customer and asked for their, what they thought of the product's strengths. From that discussion, they determined that their unique differentiation, they determined their unique differentiations and built future products that kept those in mind and returned their company to profitability. The second value driver that I want to talk a little bit in detail is called the hub and spoke, sometimes referred to the owner's trap. And we heard some of our business owners today talking about this, um, where the owner is at the, the hub of the business and all of the customers, the employees, and the suppliers are asking for the owner's time to help make decisions. Remove the hub and the business is struggling, which is why companies reliant on their owner are deeply discounted. More importantly, hub and spoke businesses are stressful to run because they can never take, break, take a break or, and all the decisions, even the most mundane ones, come to you. This is where distinguishing between how profitable your business is and how valuable your business is can come in handy. Some people use profit, profitable and valuable interchangeably, but of course they are often in conflict with one another. Instead of hiring salespeople, the owner seeking to maximize her profits would do all the selling herself. Instead of hiring a management team, the owner seeking profit would likely hire the lowest paid staff they can find to simply execute, while the profit seeker may maximize their profits. They would also be growing a business that has less value to the purchaser. So again, how robust is your leadership structure? Think about where does your business fall on this continuum? Which of the following best describes your management team? We don't have one. We have a couple of senior people who act as informal leaders, but their leadership roles are not clearly defined. We have managers in charge of sales and marketing and producing our services and products. Or we have a management team in place and they have the compensation package that provides long-term financial incentive to stay with our business. And that's more than just annual bonuses. And that's what a purchaser is looking at is, is the ownership or the leadership team that's going to be in place after the purchase. The next question that I ask you is what about your relationship with your business customers? And again, 
we show a continuum here um, as to where various businesses shake out on their uh, customer relationships. I know each of my customers by their first name and they want to be involved with me when they do any dealings with our company. All the way to, I don't know my customers personally and rarely get involved in serving an individual customers. And that goes back to the cycle that we talked about earlier where the uh, employees that are engaged are able to do the right things by the customer, thus keeping the owner um, out of the loop. So what's the benefit of this focus on value? Research by the Value Builder Group has identified a direct quantifiable relationship between the eight key value drivers and the value of your business. In a study of purchase offers of more than 30,000 businesses, the folks at Value Builder have found that the average multiple owners received was 3.6 times their pre-tax profits. However, when we isolated just those businesses that had the Value Builder score of 80 or better, the average offer was 6.1 time, times the pre-tax profit, a premium of 71%. So it does pay to build a business with an eye on creating value, and I would encourage all small businesses as they start up to think about that. You all have trusted advisors, coaches, who should be able to help you understand what drives value in your business. If you're thinking of exiting, you need to build a strategy. This is not like selling a house. You just can't add a coat of paint and move some furniture around to increase the value of the sale. To influence many of the value drivers that we talked about, you need, to, you need months of effort to demonstrate to the prospective buyer that you've built true value in your business and that you deserve the higher multiple. So I'm going to leave you with one question with this one question for you to think about on the drive back to the office this afternoon. How much unrealized value is there in my business and what can I do to improve on that? In closing, I'd like to give you an unrelated thought but an important piece of homework. Saturday is Remembrance Day. Reach out to anyone you know who has served in the military and let them know how grateful you are for their service to our great country. Thank you for your attention.